Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ramp Church Online. My name is Pastor Micah Wood, and before we begin to worship together tonight, I want to read to you one verse out of the book of Psalms, chapter number 43, and it's found right there in verse number four. It says this, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Tonight, God has joy for you, and it's found at the altar. And when you hear that, it may be a little confusing because you may think to yourself, well, the altar, do I have access to an altar? Well, in the Old Testament, the altar was in the Tabernacle of Moses, the Temple of Solomon, or the second temple built by Zerubbabel. But the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. It says, we have an altar, an altar of the new covenant that was established by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we approach that altar not by going to a building or a location, we come to that altar by faith and we get to meet with God wherever we are. So tonight, as you prepare your heart to worship, again, I wanna encourage you, God has exceeding joy for you that's found in his presence when you come to the altar and meet with him. So right where you are, make your bedroom an altar, make your living room an altar, make your home an altar, a place where you can meet with God. Let's pray together and then we'll just open up our hearts and begin to worship. Father, we thank you, as it says in Hebrews 13, that we have an altar, an altar not found in a building or in a certain location, an altar that has been established by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because of that altar, because of the blood of Jesus, wherever we are, we have access to your presence by faith. So tonight as we worship, tonight as we lift our eyes to you, I ask that we would find the exceeding joy of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people praise Where we hear praises He hears faith Who loves 
loves us and he's the one who bought us with his blood and all glory to the lamb of god all glory From Zion, God's own son, the Alpha, the Omega, ancient one, the all consuming fire from above. Oh, we'll see him on the clouds when he comes. the one who bought us with his blood and all glory to the Lamb of God all glory to you all glory all glory to the Lamb of God All glory to you All glory All glory to the Lamb of God All glory to you We lift you high And all power, dominion, all honor, all glory is yours forever and ever. All power, dominion, all honor, all glory.
Church, I want to share with you a word that I feel that is just a timely word for you right now in this season during quarantine, during this pandemic, that the world is kind of in a place of chaos and fear and strife and not knowing what's going to happen. I want to share a word with you about what God is saying in this time. And it's in Psalms 1 in the Passion Translation. And it says this, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? He won't walk in step with the wicked, nor share the sinner's way, nor be found sitting in the scorner's seat. His pleasure and passion is remaining true to the word of I am, meditating day and night in the true revelation of light. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of his life. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, and ever prosperous. And the part I really want to highlight for you guys is the part where it, it says that you will be deeply rooted in the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life. That you're not dry, you're not fainting, but you're blessed and prosperous in every season. You know, 
this is not the very first thing that has happened to the world that has been a crisis moment. If you look at the history and timeline of the world, there have been moments where there has been panic, there has been plagues, there has been all sorts of things, but it still does not change God's word. His word is true. He is still on the throne. God is still on the throne and he has his word still solid and true and we can hold on to his word as a firm foundation during this time and his word says that you are to bear fruit in every season of life that you'll be blessed and you're prosperous that you're not going to be fainting that you're not going to run dry and the key to that is because you are rooted by the brooks of bliss, that you are rooted in the word of God, because a natural byproduct of being rooted in the word of God, being right by that water, is fruit. You will have fruit in every season of life. So I just want to bless you with that, that even right now, that you would be in a place to where you could just feel the presence of God, be grounded in the word of God, and know that he is going to do everything that he has promised you that he would do through his word. And so right now, if you would like to give, there are four different ways that you can look at the bottom of the screen to give. And I just wanna pray a blessing over you during this time. So Lord, I just thank you right now that every single person who is watching this is blessed, that they will be bear fruit in every single season, that they will not grow weary in well-doing, but they will grow prosperous and be blessed in everything that they do, that they would grow deeper in the word of God, that they would feel your presence in a deep way, and that this will be a time of refreshing in the name of Jesus. We bless you and we love you guys. Well, one more time, I wanna say thank you for joining Ramp Church Online. You know, last week, we all celebrated Easter Sunday together. And I just wanna be vulnerable and share something with you. As a church leader, sometimes, once you get past Easter, you're not quite sure what to do with yourself because the whole first quarter of your year is just building to this event, you know, where you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. You're getting ready for Palm Sunday, then it goes on to Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and so much of your time and attention is making sure that Sunday comes together, you know, appropriately for the day and for the event that you're celebrating. And so I experienced that this year, of course, we all celebrated Easter a little differently, but you kind of build up to Easter Sunday. And so then I wake up Monday, right after Easter, and when I wake up, I'm praying and kind of asking the Lord, all right, Lord, what do we do now? We kind of hit the climactic moment of Easter. What happens now? And as I was in prayer Monday morning, I simply kept hearing this phrase from the Holy Spirit, infallible proofs, infallible proofs. And if you're familiar with the beginning of the book of Acts, you know that that phrase doesn't come out of just thin air, but it comes from Luke's introduction to the book of Acts. So before we go any further, let's check out those first few verses, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and identify where that phrase, infallible proofs, comes from. Here's what it says. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now we'll come back to that phrase in a moment. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. There you go, infallible proofs. Being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So where does that phrase infallible proofs come from? It comes from the 40 day period between Easter resurrection and the day of ascension. There were 40 days from when Jesus was raised from the dead and when he actually ascended into heaven to the Father. And during that 40 days, Jesus just kept showing up to his disciples. They'd be in a room together, you know, afraid and sort of all huddled together. Then boom, Jesus would show up. They'd be over here fishing and Jesus would show up on the shore. They would be in this prayer meeting over there at a house and Jesus would just show up. And whenever Jesus would show up, he would do surprising things and surprising 
surprising ways, but he would prove to them, I am the living Jesus and I am raised from the dead. And during that 40 day window, there were infallible proofs, miracles that he did to confirm that he is alive. So as I began to hear that phrase in prayer Monday morning and study the scripture out of Acts chapter one, verses one through three, it awakened faith inside my heart to say, Lord, could it be that during this season, after Easter, before Ascension, that you just want to show up in some surprising ways? Could it be that you just want to reveal the living Jesus to us in ways that are infallible, in ways that confirm 100% that you are alive? Not just that you're alive in heaven way off somewhere where we can't see you or feel you, but you're alive right here by the power of of your Holy Spirit. So that put me on a fresh course of prayer to say, God, we want to experience the living Jesus in fresh ways. And when I think about that idea of infallible proofs, it reminds me of a, of a lecture I attended several years ago. Me and my wife, Delana, we attended a lecture in Birmingham, Alabama from an author named Eric Metaxas, one of my favorite authors because he writes about the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and William Wilberforce. Some of you know those two men of God through history and just know what an incredible life they lived testifying about the reality of Jesus Christ. William Wilberforce, of course, did that in England, helping to end the slave trade. Dietrich Bonhoeffer did that in Germany during the days of Hitler. He was a witness for Jesus, stood with the Jewish people during the Holocaust, just amazing, amazing men. And while we were there at that lecture, Eric Metaxas said something interesting. He said that early on in his you know, uh, writing experience, writing career, he wrote a book that was basically an apologetics book, proving God on a philosophical level. So he wrote this book and tries to tackle a lot of the hard questions. And after he writes this book, he gets contacted by CNN. And CNN says, we wanna interview you about your book concerning God. So he said, when he, get, when he gets the call and he gets off the phone and agrees to do the interview, you know, he feels really like, man, I've really gotta prepare myself for this interview, interview. I've got to you know, make sure I know the answers to all the hard questions, all the philosophical questions, if there's a good God, why is there suffering in the world? And you know, really prepared himself in that way. He said, but when he got to the place of the interview, he was surprised about what they asked him about. They went over and over and over again, not to the big issues in the book, but this one little paragraph he had written about William Wilberforce. Now, he had not written his book Amazing Grace yet about William Wilberforce. He had just written this paragraph within this other book that he was talking about. And he said in this interview, they just keep going back to William Wilberforce again and again. And he was a little confused by that until he had this realization. In the larger world of proving God, there is no greater argument then changed lives. And he said this, lives are the greatest apologetic. That when you see someone's life that is fully surrendered to God, fully transformed by God, that is the greatest witness. That is the most infallible proof that Jesus is alive. So when I think about that, I love to tell the testimony of who Jesus is and what he has done. And it reminds me of John chapter 12. Why? Because when you go to John chapter 12, there is a life that had been changed by Jesus and it became an infallible proof about Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus being the Messiah, the King of Israel. And of course, the story I'm referring to is about a man named Lazarus. In John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in his hometown of Bethany. And then right after that, we get into John chapter 12, where John goes back to Bethany, back to the house of Lazarus, and watch what happens in John chapter 12, verse number nine. It says, and a great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there in Bethany at Lazarus' house. And they came, the, this community of, of, of Jews, they came to Bethany, to Lazarus' house, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away 
and believed in Jesus. Now, we're going to come back to that, but let me keep reading. And again, it's a little odd and feels a little backward to read the next part because it's about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It's about Palm Sunday, about the tri triumphal entry as Jesus comes in riding on a donkey. But I want to read this because it's going to connect to this whole idea of changed lives being the infallible proof that Jesus is alive. It goes on and it says this, the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they had heard about Jesus, that he was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people, watch verse 17, therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, those people bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Verse number 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, this is an amazing story. Let me break down three components. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. One life that was changed. One life that was transformed. One life that was brought out of the tomb. And because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, because there was one testimony of one changed lives, what life, watch what happened. Three spheres of influence were impacted because of one testimony. First, the local community of Jews came to see Jesus. It says that when Jesus came to Bethany, to the house of Lazarus, that all the Jews in that area came to the house because they heard that Jesus was there and that Lazarus was there. The man that Jesus had raised from the dead. One testimony caused an entire region, an entire community of Jews to rush to a place to see Jesus. But not only did that testimony awaken that one community, but we see on Palm Sunday that the testimony of Jesus actually awakens the entire city of Jerusalem. Because it says those who had been there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they are the ones that bore witness to Jesus as he was coming to Jerusalem. Therefore, the people came out to meet him. What people? The people of Jerusalem were awakened by those who knew the testimony of Lazarus. So the first sphere of influence, the testimony of Lazarus, awakens his local community. Then his local community awakens an international city. It awakens an entire city to recognize Jesus is the king. But it doesn't stop there. Because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, not only was the local community of Bethany awakened, and not only was the international city of Jerusalem awakened, watch what it says in the end of verse 19. The Pharisees say, look, the world has gone after him. Three spheres of influence, local community, international city, and now the whole world is going after Jesus because of one man's testimony. So when I go back and I think about that phrase, the Holy Spirit quickened in my heart, infallible proofs. Yes, I believe Jesus just wants to show up during this season. He just wants to reveal himself and let us know that he is here and he's alive. But I also believe that God wants to use your story, your testimony of how Jesus has transformed your life as an infallible proof to someone else that Jesus is who he says he is. One Lazarus, and then look what happened. Bethany's awakened, Jerusalem's awakened, and now the whole world knows who Jesus is and they're going after him. You have no idea how much your story can change people's lives around you. When you tell others how your life has been changed by Jesus, you're not just telling them about a religious experience. You are testifying that Jesus is alive. So I wanna encourage you right here in this post-Easter season 
that you don't stop sharing the good news of Jesus being alive. You keep sharing, and the way you keep sharing it is just by telling your story. Tell other people what God has done for you. Sometimes we feel like we don't have the appropriate level of theological sophistication to tell other people about Jesus. That makes me think of the story in John chapter 9 where there was this man born blind and he's healed by Jesus and he is just being in, interrogated by the religious leaders. He is just being you know, drilled with all these theological questions and he simply responds, listen, I can't explain all the theology. This is John chapter 9 verse 25. I can't explain all the theology. I can't tell you whether he was a sinner or a prophet. Here's what I can tell you. I once was blind, but now I see. In other words, I can't explain with sophistication all the theology of who Jesus is, but I can tell you this. Before I met him, I was blind, and after I met him, I could see. My life was changed, and that simple story became a major testimony witness to the power of God. And as we close the service this evening, we're going to do one more song that simply tells the story of Lazarus. And the reason why I wanted our team to sing it is because it not only tells the story of Lazarus, it tells the story of every single one of us. That we all at one time were dead in trespasses and sins, but Jesus, the Savior of the world, called our name. And Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 25, those who are in the tomb, when they hear my name, they will live. Let this story remind you, let this song you were about to sing remind you of what Jesus has done for you. And let it encourage you to share your story with, other, with others. Because your story can become an infallible proof that Jesus is alive. stood outside